Hello, my name is Steve Saylor, and I want to thank the Games You Are uh, conference for uh, pre allowing us to be able to present to you today. Uh, today's talk is going to be uh, the Climbing Mountains 10 Years in Game Accessibility. Uh, this is a combo presentation between myself and Ian Hamilton. I'll be the one presenting today, and we're going to be talking about essentially the 10 years of gaming history. Um, if you know a little bit about uh, ourselves, Ian Hamilton uh, and I are accessibility advocates and consultants. Uh, we've been working in the industry um, for, for quite a while, and we've consulted with studios on how to be able to make their games uh, more accessible uh, as possible. Uh, and we want to thank Games You Are for allowing us to be able to uh, present to you today. Um, so let's get started. So this is again with the history of Climbing Mountains 10 years in game accessibility. We've been We've been very blessed to kind of see the uh, the fruits of a lot of labors over the past 10 years just in regards to game accessibility alone. So we'll be kind of touching on some of the highlights uh, and just some of the milestones that have got us to this point of where we are within game accessibility. Since the first Games You Are Summit in 2010, the field of accessibility has changed beyond all recognition. So in keeping with the themes of today's event, what we have for you is a little look back through history. Now, game accessibility actually goes all the way back to 1950 with Birdie the Brain, one of the earliest games, including configurable difficulty thanks to the designer recognizing the need for barriers to flex in line with human variants, a core principle that underpins pretty much of, uh, of today's accessibility work. Uh, for this presentation, though, we're going to be skipping ahead to 2010, but if you want more about what happened between 1950 and 2010, uh, there'll be a link uh, on that last slide. So what was the landscape like in 2010? Uh, it was largely focused around three groups. Special Effect, which had been around for, for since basically around 2007. Uh, Able Gamers, which was founded in 2004. And a few handfuls of independent developer, gamers, and academic advocates. Uh, a group of which actually banded together as the IGDA's Accessibility SIG in back in 2003. Uh, hardware accessibility was mostly homebrew and hacks. There was very little accessibility awareness or implementation amongst devs, especially in the AAAs. Uh, with no full-time accessibility roles anywhere in the industry, uh, there was wide widespread negative attitudes actually from gamers. This was all is all very different to how things are today. So we're going to take you on a little stroll through a few key moments of that journey. We're going to start off actually with a feature. Uh, this is a setting actually added in the FIFA 2010 to reduce the complex controls down to just a stick and two buttons with a healthy dose of contextual guessing at player intent. It's a really nice feature that actually many games today could learn from. This was pretty typical of accessibility in 2010 actually. Uh, occasionally a single feature would kind of just pop up and usually that wasn't designed with disability in mind. but still actually had uh, some accessibility benefits. I personally actually call it kind of like accidental accessibility. Um, so it's just, that's just, you'll find that actually several times that that actually does come up uh, in different games, even within the past 10 years. Uh, there were some comprehensive efforts though, like Shoot One Up uh, by solo indie dev Nathan Fouts with a range of uh, features that are only just beginning to spread now, like game speed, high contrast, auto fire, even an option to reduce the controls to a single button. We've kind of actually been seeing that in regards to like if you heard of the term assist mode some of these features actually been kind of been starting to add spread back into uh, games today uh, for a long time it was indies like these who were at the forefront of innovation also in 2010 the accessibility sigs website launched uh, the first real collection of accessibility research best practices advice etc and the bbc launched their internal publisher level mandatory game accessibility standards and also in washington dc a uh, law called the cv AA was signed in. Not many people in the industry were aware of it at that time, but it would come to have actually a, a great influence. 2011 saw a, actually a huge big step by Film Victoria, an Australian government body that provides grant funding to the creative industries around Melbourne. They had accessibility, in, sorry, they had accessibility requirements for film and TV funding was conditional on subtitling your output, but nothing for games. So they actually decided to change that. They used a simple approach, asked devs how they were considering accessibility, and also a box on the form that says if you aren't considering Considering, considering it, tell us why. Nearly 10 years later, and not one developer has ever put anything in that second box. Uh, this carrot approach for prototype funding meant devs considering it early and allowed the Melbourne dev scene to race ahead. 
Uh, elsewhere, single features were trickling in, influenced by disabled gamers. Uh, MLB The Show launched with a single button assist mode after input from Han Smith. Uh, Dead Space gamed remapping following a petition by Gareth Garrett. Uh, the Daggers accessibility review site was launched by Josh Straub. And in Florida, Tara Volker, who some of you of course know, uh, kicked off an accessibility challenge at a local global game jam site. Uh, this grew over the coming years. Now every year, Global Game Jam has optional accessibility challenges challenges across every site around the world, taken up by tens of thousands of developers, raising awareness, busting misconceptions, and giving hands-on experiences for those devs uh, during the Global Game Jam. Now, in 2012, actually two new resources launched, uh, Includification by Able Gamers and GameAccessibilityGuidelines.com by a collaboration of developers, academics, and specialists. These were not the first accessibility guidelines for games, but they were the first two resources to gain wide, sc wide scale traction uh, with developers. Uh, the Warfighter Engage charity was founded, aimed at using and adapting gaming technology and rehabilitation of service injured veterans. Uh, I'll be coming back to Warfighter Engage again when when we get to 2018. Um, Dion Decker launched an, an award-winning Wii game uh, designed for... Uh Sorry, I actually, I think I probably mispronounced it. I apologize. I'm terrible at names. I'm sorry. Day on Decker. <laughs> Day on Decker. I'm sorry. Launched an award-winning Wii game designed for sighted and partially sighted children to play together. Uh, a lengthy Ubisoft forum actually with thread went up asking for remapping in the upcoming Assassin's Creed 3. Uh, they never got, got to it and wasn't actually added until uh, Assassin's Creed Origins years later. Uh, but every single ply on that thread was a positive message of support for disabled gamers. And that was actually a really watershed moment um, because it was a, it, it saw as a sign of shifting understanding about accessibility and expectations uh, from the wider gaming community. So gamers started to take notice and actually started to want to be able to petition studios in order to be able to want to have more accessibility uh, in their games. Now, in 2013, Injustice became the first AAA game to include a consideration for blind gamers. Uh, fighting games are actually generally pretty blind accessible through a combination of like stereo sound and good sound design. You can usually tell exactly where each fighter is and exactly which move they're pulling off based on the sound effects within the game. But Injustice added interactive uh, background objects like the tree here, uh, like on the right that Bane is about to reach into the background, rip out and, you know, back raven over the head with uh, they also add an option to turn on a simple audio ping when a player is standing in front of them um Moving forward, Australia continued their push with the establishment of a dedicated accessibility award category in their annual Australian Game Development Awards, uh, something that actually will come back with a vengeance in 2020. We'll get into that in a bit. Uh, and in response to a change.org petition by a deaf gamer, Steam added info to store pages to say whether each game had subtitles or not, and also offer the option to filter the store to only show games that have them. Uh, a free to use game accessibility symbol was developed by Barry Ellis of One Switch and has since spread through games, documentation, and events as a standardized way of specifying accessibility information. In 2014, several prominent AAA games... Um, well, sorry. <laughs> sorry, in 2014, several prominent AAA games included colorblind support either at launch or through patches uh, such as Borderlands 2 and SimCity. At the same time, sites like Kotaku and IGN published widely read articles on colorblindness. Uh, these two things together resulted in rapid incre increase in awareness and consideration over the following years. Uh, the first time that any accessibility consideration had approached being a common, let alone standard consideration. Uh, to the extent that just two years later, it had gone from a rare novelty to a player expectation. In 2016, a journalist actually put out an apology piece for failing to mention in their review of The Witness that the game was not colorblind accessible. We've since seen the, the, this thing happen with quick time event toggles, uh, with subtitle presentation, features within a couple of years progressing from rare to expected. And that's within the development cycle of a single game. So you need to stay ahead of the curve. If you can do that, rather than fall victim to those changing expectations, you'll be one of the people setting them. 
Now, still in the topic, the topic of color blindness, uh, Unreal Engine implemented a color blindness simulator. Now, this was the first time an engine made steps to help developers make their games more expe- accessible. Expect to, be, ex- expect to see more of that in the future with future engines and with stuff that's going to be added in for accessibility, whether it's plugins or tools that are going to be built into the engines themselves. So expect that to be able to become uh, hopefully a standard within uh, the development community. Uh, the quad stick launched a uh, a sip puff controller that builds upon uh, upon Kevin or sorry Ken Yankovitz's 30 year legacy of accessible controller development, and an article by Richard Moss went up on The Verge called "Why Accessibility Matters," involving a wide range of accessibility advocates, gamers, and developers. Articles like that are reasonably common today, but for its time, this was a huge milestone. Uh, this article is where it really felt like accessibility was becoming a larger, encompassing movement, and we started to see things being progressing from there. In 2015, we saw the first impact of the CVAA legislation in the form of the compliance waiver for consoles and networks coming to an end. This meant that any communication functionality in products like PlayStation services, like as well as Xbox Live, must be law be must by law be accessible to all kinds of disabilities. Uh, this was a key driver for both the PS4 and Xbox One gaining their initial suites of accessibility functionality in 2015, which continued to grow and evolve way beyond legal compliance over the course of their life cycles and now into the current generation of the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X and S of consoles. After lobbying for the accessibility community led by Barry Ellis, Apple implemented platform level functionality to make one button games like Flappy Birds accessible using external accessibility switch inputs that send an on off signal like a button or a tube to blow into exactly actually the same tech that the Xbox adaptive controller is designed to be compatible with. So this made thousands of games accessible to hugely underserved audiences overnight. And then Evolve became the first AAA game to publish its accessibility info on its website. Destiny became the first AAA game to include an accessibility menu. The menu only included two options and separate accessibility menus aren't necessarily a good idea uh, because all settings are accessibility, uh, to be honest. But it's for its day, It was a big step. Now, jumping to 2016, it saw the launch of Uncharted 4, a AAA title with what by 2016 standards was a huge array of accessibility considerations and extensive publicity efforts around it by PlayStation. This had a really significant and direct impact on many other developers across the whole development spectrum, but particularly on AAA developers. One of the big publishers even internally referred to accessibility wave that spread through their company over the subsequent years as the Uncharted effect. Phil Spencer, head of Xbox, took to Twitter to praise PlayStation's efforts, uh, a son of things to come, of how accessibility would become a source of people stepping across traditional barriers to collaborate both within companies and between competitors. Able Gamers was actually invited to speak at the White House, which is really cool. Uh, PlayStation hosted an accessibility panel at PSX, uh, their most watched panel uh, actually out from the event. Uh, Sean Layden, former head of uh, PlayStation, and Phil Spencer uh, were making public commitments. Uh, Karen Stevens at EA was made full-time accessibility lead. Bryce Johnson and Evelyn Thomas were full-time on platform accessibilities, accessibility things for Xbox. But this was the first time in-house role working on accessibility of games. Others actually followed, and now there are actually 40 full-time roles within studios for accessibility of games. And there were actually three new game accessibility hires in the past month alone. As you can tell, the accessibility train is now picking up a lot of speed. Um, for Now, part of that momentum was an increasing number of people working on accessibility, an increasing body of a professional knowledge and experience. So with 2017 came the first edition of GA Conference, Game Accessibility Conference. Uh, it's a direct equivalent to the Games You Are event, a uh, conference run by the IGA, IGDA's Accessibility SIG. It quickly grew and expanded to a Europe edition as well. Uh, previously, an accessibility talk getting on the lineup at a game dev conference meant a general awareness riser, but having 
this dedicated conference meant, as with Games You Are, a forum for studying knowledge and experiences at a bit deeper level than just that, while also having a central hub for people working the field to come together, network, find collaborators, and get some group therapy, because, you know, it's conferences, we can sometimes kind of need that. <laughs> um, elsewhere, Microsoft launched their inclusive tech lab, a place for developers and the community to come together, and a home for all kinds of fun bits of technology to play with. The Nintendo Switch patched in their first accessibility features, marking the first time in the history of the industry that every major gaming platform, Switch, Xbox, PS4, Vita, PC, Mac, iOS, and Android had dedicated system level accessibility features. And to cap things off as part of a fundraising event for special effect, even Kim Kardashian tweeted in support of disabled gamers to her at the time, 56 million Twitter followers. So it was starting to gain a lot of traction. And 2018, uh, 2018's biggest splash was actually the arrival of the Xbox Adaptive Controller, uh, developed over several years initially in partnership with Warfighter Engaged and later with a wide range of charities, specialists and gamers. Uh, I'm sure everyone's at least partially familiar with, with this now, but at a high level, it's actually a switch interface, uh, a way to hook up accessibility switches, uh, that range of on, uh, on slash off input devices, as I mentioned earlier. So basically it actually kind of uses a a headphone jack that all it really needs is an on off sort of like signal and you can use a button you can use a switch you can use a pedal and you can basically remap them to corresponding buttons that would normally be seen on an xbox controller um, you can see actually in this pic uh, picture there are loads of ports along the back of it hooked up to that are a bunch of light touch sensitive buttons on the table and an additional large button mounted next to his cheek it also had usb ports to hook up joysticks as he is doing here um, now it wasn't the the first device of its kind there have been actually many before but it was drastically cheaper much higher build quality and looked like a natural part of the xbox ecosystem and also the fact that it was microsoft who built it sent a really powerful statement uh, developing hardware is a pretty strong way of putting your money where your mouth is and to be honest actually i really do love the look of the xbox adaptive controller it really does look like an xbox console it would be sitting beside it and it just kind of looks like it's part of that ecosystem and it was still really cool and still one of the best controllers that we have today. There was other, t there was a ton of other stuff happening too. Uh, the Can I Play That review site was founded. EA implemented a dedicated accessibility feedback portal linked to their bug tracking system, uh, soon followed by similar efforts by Mixer, Ubisoft, Warner Brothers, and Blizzard. Uh, Celeste launched and in reaction to the discourse around Cuphead's inflexible design, included a bunch of assist accessibility assists. It was to go on to as become as influential as a game as Uncharted with Celeste's assist mode which became like a huge, huge wave, uh, had a huge wave within the accessibility community. Uh, it shaped the accessibility mindset of many other devs uh, outside just of the indie space. And then came the AAAs. In 2016, a single game, including a handful of features, was huge news. In 2018, the impact of this was starting to be felt. Some of the AAAs making comparable efforts to Uncharted 4 included Forza, Forza Horizon 4, The Crew 2, Marvel's Spider-Man, Black Ops 4, Starlink, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, State of Decay 2, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Battlefield 5, Sea of Thieves, Madden 19, Monster Hunter World, FIFA 19, God of War, Red Dead Dead Redemption 2, now a staggering turnaround in the space of just two years. Particularly important are Spider-Man and God of War. These were the two top grossing PS4 games of that year, both with huge critical acclaim and conclusively putting to bed the myth that accessibility loses money and dilutes creative free, uh, vision. The first day of 2019 saw the end of the CVAA's waiver for games, meaning all games for release in the USA are now legally obligated to ensure that both chat functionality and chat related info slash UI is accessible to people with a wide range of disabilities. This marked the first time that mainstream games have had explicit legal accessibility requirements. The impact has been profound, not just directly, but also spurring development of technologies like text scaling and text to speech support that are being applied 
worldwide way beyond communication, paving the way for grassroots developers who previously found it a struggle to be heard. Now accessibility was a topic that all of like all of management knew about and providing an ex extra push for people who had been aware of accessibility but not quite taken the plunge. Now that accessibility was a requirement for a small aspect of their game, they were running with it, taking that as a cue to think about how to offer a good gameplay experience to as many p players as possible. Elsewhere, Microsoft put their money where their mouth is for a Super Bowl spot about the adaptive controller, which was huge. It was seen over 100 million people, and T-Pain tweeted about it, Cher even tweeted about it. Now, also, Able Gamers launched their new APX design patterns. Google included accessibility information and filters in the Stadia Store and Google Play app. Accessibility mega threads became a thing. Tweets about accessibility issues that received many thousands of likes and shares and many hundreds of, of replies. Now, these are powerful, illustrating demand, shifting mindsets, raising awareness, and providing a gold mine of feedback. A huge uptick in accessibility of events actually also happened as well, covering companies like Microsoft, EA, Oculus, Indie Mega Booth, Ubisoft, PlayStation, and Crystal Dynamics, and events like E3, Gamescom, XO19, and Paris Games Week all had considerations like ASL, live captioning, and auto, audio description for talks, announcements, and broadcasts. We also had quiet rooms, braille maps, low tables, and adaptive controllers available at booths. It was becoming increasingly hard to find a AAA game that didn't include accessibility considerations, with studios pushing the bar even higher with games like Division 2 and Gears 5, though still being outstripped by indies with Sequin Storm and Eagle Island, Eagle Island sitting at the very top of the industry, and both by solo indie devs. And then came the I'm Spartacus moment. Uh, in response to Sekiro Related gamer tweets claiming that accessibility compromises developers' vision for their games. Corey Barlog, uh, the game director you probably know of, of God of War, uh, especially the 2018 God of War, um, he's at Sony Santa Monica. He tweeted out, and I quote, accessibility has never and will never be a compromise to my vision. Rami Ismail of, uh, of Lombier uh, copy and pasted that, and many other developers actually followed across the industry followed suit, uh, either saying the same or adding their own extra detail as to why. This outpouring of support more than uh, any other recent progress was a clear sign that accessibility was now truly part of the fabric of the games industry. Now, here's the big one. So the big accessibility headline of 2020 was The Last of Us Part Two. Um, yes, this is my, my a thumbnail for my video. Uh, when Uncharted 4 came out, it followed the standard journey. Its feature set was the result of a few people pushing late in development, and then, as they always do, thinking, ah, man, if only we'd thought of this earlier, we could have done so much more and done so much better. Um, so that's what they actually did with that Naughty Dog. Their secret sauce for The Last of Us 2 was to consider accessibility early. The result combined with plenty of user research and working with a range of consultants was a game that shot the bar extremely high, including being the first AAA game to be built from the ground up to be fully playable by people who are completely blind. Uh, but it was a busy year elsewhere too, for mainstream hardware developers jumping with, with the Logitech's adaptive gaming kit and Hori's equivalent to the Xbox adaptive controller, but for the Nintendo Switch. The launch of the new platforms, including full controller backward compatibility for the Xbox Series X and S, including expan uh, expensive accessibility devices and a whole swath of new accessibility goodies for the PS5, a whole bunch of new resources for both developers and gamers, the arrival of audio descriptions for trailers, which is a separate audio track narrating what is happening visually for people who have difficulty seeing it. Uh, Ubisoft actually was the first comp uh, company in any industry to implement YouTube's beta audio description functionality. Technically, it uses the ability to be able to add multiple audio tracks to a single video, and they decided to be able to take that and actually add the audio descript the described track as one of those tracks, which was really, really cool. Something that, again, had never been seen before in any industry. Uh, there was continued acceleration of breadth and depth of considerations in games, from Hyperdot to Assassin's Creed Valhalla, from moving out to Miles Morales, which in some ways even exceeded some of the efforts of The Last of Us Part Two. This was all capped off by the end of the year, by uh, then year by an explosion in accessibility awards, both dedicated accessibility specific ceremonies and mainstream gaming awards adding ga categories for accessibility, including of course the Game Awards, which watched which were watched by 
by over 80 million people. And The Last of Us won that accessibility award at the Game Awards as well. Now, that brings me to, uh, brings us to, up to today. I hope what you've uh, seen has given you a bit of sense of where we've come from and the trajectory where we are now. Uh, the trajectory it needs to be and the trajectory needs to be on. There still hasn't even been a single AAA game that has managed to nail all the basics of tech size, subtitle presentation, effect and camera uh, camera intensity, remapping and colorblind support. We are still a very long way from any gamer being able to pick up any game and have a reasonable expectation that they won't be needlessly locked out. But the momentum is there. People care. People are learning. People are collaborating to drive the field forward. And so long as we continue to do that, we will get even closer to gaming reaching its full potential. And just a couple of links to finish on here. Uh, the first two are some nice insight, uh, both into pre-2010 and more detail on what has happened recently, too. Uh, the third contains a handy bunch of links covering pretty much all you could ever want to know uh, about accessibility. Um, so I want to build that is it for us. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate you uh, paying attention as best you can and watching uh, this presentation. I hope you learned a little bit and got to, kind of got to see with a good perspective of what accessibility has been like and how much work has been done just within the past 10 years. Uh, again, I want to thank Games You Are for allowing us to be able to speak to you today, and I hope you enjoy uh, or have enjoyed the rest of your conference. Thank you so much for watching. As always, bye-bye. Have a great day.